what is this? This is a speech spectrum. So let's figure out how we got into this mess. Okay, so we can start with the speech sound. Um, this is just a recording of the syllable sa. Sa. See, you can believe me. Um, so to make a spectrum, first we want to figure out what part of the sound we want the spectrum of. So the spectrum tells us what frequencies are in the sound. And suppose I want to think about just this vowel part, the ah, and I want to think about just the center part. So I'm going to select a chunk of that sound here. I'm going to go up to spectrum and say view spectral slice. Okay, so this doesn't look quite as pretty as the thing we just um, opened the video with, and that's because we're viewing from 0 hertz all the way up to the Nyquist frequency of 22,050 no, 22, hertz. So most of the speech energy is way below that. So what we want to do is select from 0 to, let's say, 5,000. So now I've selected it. To zoom into it, I'm going to press this SEL button. Now we have something that's a little bit more helpful. So on the spectrum, now I can see the harmonics, right? I can count them one, two, three, four, five. Maybe I can count all the harmonics, or I could just move on to something else, like looking at where the formant frequencies are. Here's a formant frequency. Here's a formant frequency. They're the ones that stand out above all the rest, okay? Sometimes it's more or less challenging to find the formant, so this one down here is a little bit too low in frequency to call a formant, um, but it's still a harmonic. So that's a bit of a tricky business that we'll go over in other videos. Um, but let's just focus on what we can get from the spectrum itself. We're viewing again from 0 to 5000 hertz, and where I click on the spectrum, it'll tell me the frequency that corresponds to the place I clicked. It doesn't mean that there's something there, because I can click over here, and it says 4410 hertz, but there's not really a lot of energy there. So for this clicking to be meaningful, I have to be pretty accurate with where I'm clicking. So suppose I want to um, really analyze these lower frequency formants. Um, maybe the view I'm in right now isn't especially good, and I want to click and drag that part and zoom into it. Again, I'm going to press SEL. Now I've zoomed in, and I have a pretty good look at exactly where these harmonics are. So uh, the first one is at 100 hertz. The second one is around 200 hertz. third one is around 300 hertz. You can see the pattern here. These are all going to be integer multiples of each other. That's really what it means to be a harmonic. So let's go back um, to our sound. You'll notice that I, I selected and dragged over this pretty long stretch that it turned out to be uh, 172 milliseconds. Suppose I'm interested in just this really short segment right here, right, which is so short it's not even showing us the time. If I asked for a spectral slice here, you'll notice this looks very different. If I again just view from 0 to 5000 hertz, it doesn't have nearly as much detail as what we saw on the first spectrum. And the reason for this is that the amount of detail you see is a, is a result of how much time sampling went into the measurement. So here, not a lot of time went into it. If I sample a lot of time, let's say the whole vowel, and again make that spectral slice, now as we view those lower frequencies, we get a lot of detailed information. So the temporal precision is inversely proportional to the frequency precision. What do I mean by temporal precision? Well, here I selected the whole vowel, which means that I'm looking at all the frequency components over the course of the whole vowel. So if there's anything that changed over the course of that vowel, the spectrum is not going to show me that change. It's going to just put everything into the same bin. Whereas if I made a spectrum of this slice right at the vowel onset, and the spectrum looks different than the uh, the corresponding spectrum at the vowel offset, that would be a change maybe I'm interested in. A more egregious mistake would be to make a spectrum of the whole syllable like this. So if I viewed a spectral slice of the whole syllable, um, there are a few problems here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, zoom between 0 and around 7000 hertz, okay, and so we can still see those harmonics and those formants, but we also see this big chunk of higher frequency energy. And the reason for this is that this is the part of the spectrum that corresponds to the S sound here. So if we had just made a spectral slice of the S, you'll notice, again, if we just view from 0 to 5000 hertz, 
this looks very different than the valve spectrum, which had a lot of energy down in the low frequencies. Now we're seeing energy climb up in, in intensity at the higher frequencies. And if we zoomed out, we'd see that the frequency peak is really way up here um, at around 5,500 hertz. So if we go back to what we just did in selecting the whole syllable, the problem was all the energy corresponding to the S and all the energies corresponding to the vowel all got lumped into the same bin and the spectrum didn't really tell us which frequencies came from which segment. So what you want to do in making a spectrum is decide um, the boundaries of the segment you want to analyze and maybe that can include specific portions within a phoneme, right? So maybe I can analyze the onset of the S as different than the offset of the S. Maybe I can analyze the onset of the vowel different than the offset. But I need to also choose a significantly, you know, a sufficient amount of time to do that analysis. So if I zoom into this and say, oh, let's just analyze, let's say, three pitch periods like this and view a spectral slice, that's just enough to get a pretty basic outline of this spectrum, but I'm not getting a whole lot of harmonic detail in this. I'm just getting a smoothed over representation. So maybe what I want to do is analyze a longer stretch of time. Now, I'm smoothing over any changes that happen intermediate um, you know, between these boundaries, but what I'll get as I view the spectral slice is a lot more detail when I look for those harmonics. One of the skills you want to develop is a comparison between the spectrum and the spectrogram. So let's zoom in um, to a syllable here. Okay. So what I can do um, in looking for the formants, for example, in the spectrogram, what I'm going to do is set the settings so that I only view things up to 3500 hertz. This is pretty low frequency for typical analysis, but what it does is give me a pretty good view of the first, second, third formant. And they're roughly at frequencies around 776. 1226, about 2350-ish, um, and so if I made a spectrogram, uh, a spectrum of this stretch of time right here, what you'll see is I can put that to the side, and I can click on these and find there's that number around 770, in this case 750, here's my number around 1228, Here's my number around 2400. So what I'm doing here is putting these side by side. And we're a little squeezed on the screen, but we still have just enough resolution to see that when I see a dark band here around 750, I see a pretty high band here in the spectrum around the same number, about to the same degree of my accuracy of clicking. And our second formant here around 1250, our second peak in the spectrum, is close to that, you know, depending on which pixel I click on. So what we want to do in the spectrum is get an intuition for the, the different peaks and where they correspond uh, in the spectrogram. You also start to want... You also want to start to get an intuition for different features that you can recover just on the spectrum itself. So as we are viewing the spectrum of this vowel here, and viewing different features on the spectrum, like the presence of the harmonics, the fact that a lot of the the highest level energy is in the lower frequencies and it kind of tapers off as you get to the higher frequencies, that's something that's very representative of most vowel sounds. On the other hand, if you look at the spectrum of the S, here, as we zoom into that frequency range that's typical for doing our speech analysis, we don't get that heavy presence of high energy in the lower frequencies. Instead, we get higher frequency energy, which should come as no surprise, because if you pronounce S, um, it's pretty high frequency. We also don't have that systematic pattern of harmonics. Um, the relationship between these peaks is not really systematic in the way that we saw in the harmonics that were spaced by um, equal um, intervals of, say, 100 hertz. In this case, um, these are just intervals that are more or less randomly spaced. Okay, another thing you want to think about is um, a combination of a voiced sound and a fricative sound. So for example, if we have a voiced sound like ja or za, um, then we're going to get some elements of the voicing and some elements um, that look like a fricative. So here's an example of a voiced consonant. Va. Uh, va. 
So that's going to be a pretty tough one to look at. Let's let's push that off until later. Here's a ja. Ja. Okay. So if we take a spectrum of this je portion, okay. Now we have something that's kind of complicated because we have the presence of low frequency harmonics here, but then we have a lot of um, high frequency energy up here in the je sound. So this is just uh, emblematic of what it means to be a voiced fricative. The fricative part has that high frequency energy, that's the sibilant energy for je, and then the lower frequencies actually um, is where the, the harmonics actually show up. And so this should make sense because as we're looking at this on the spectrogram, we see the higher frequency energy up here, and then we see the lower frequency energy down here, which just tells us that it's voiced. Okay, the last thing we want to do in this video is show you a little trick you can do using Prot Spectra. What we have here is the syllable za, and what I want to do is make a spectrum of the z portion. Okay, so I can highlight this. So I've been, you know, going up to say view spectral slice. Another quick little shortcut you can do is just Control L on a Windows uh, machine. So what we have here is the spectrum for za. We can see the high frequency fricative energy here. Um, as well as the low frequency harmonics. Okay, and um, a neat trick you can do in a prot spectrum is highlight a frequency range that you want to listen to and play the sound as if those were the only frequencies there. So if I've, I've selected this range, I'll click this, and you can just hear a high passed version. Um, you can also hear a low passed version if I only you know, select the lower frequency regions. So as I play that, it doesn't really have that Z quality because the, the parts of the, of the sound that make it sound like that high ringing sibilant sound um, are way up here, whereas the low frequency parts that make it sound voiced are down here. And when we combine them both together, we get a Z. And there's one more thing we want to say uh, with regard to spectra. Um, whether in prot or anything else, what the spectrum will show us is the frequency composition of the sound, but it doesn't show us um, things as they change over time. So what we have here is the vowel um, in the word hide, hide, right here. And if I adjust the spectrogram just a little bit to zoom in on those frequencies that are important for the vowel, and if I show the formant tracking, and if I show the formant tracking more visibly, there we go. Um, we can see that the formant, the first formant starts high and then drifts downward. The second formant starts right here in the middle and then it drifts up. So we can see that the frequency content is changing over time. And if I took this whole vowel segment and made a spectrum out of it, the problem is the spectrum doesn't tell us which parts of the signal were at the beginning and which were at the end. So this is a pretty specific limitation and the reason why we don't capture, um, we don't look for vowel dynamics um, and the things that are representative of, say, dialect differences just using spectra. This is really where spectrograms or other kinds of dynamic represent representations really turn out to be useful. So there's plenty more to say about spectra, in including um, comparisons between specific vowels or consonants that we'll probably get to in other videos, but hopefully this has um, been a pretty good overview about just how to orient yourself to the spectrum how to create it, and the different um, properties that um, will determine what it is that you're seeing.